Thank you so much for taking us on a journey uh, in all that has happened uh, in the last one year or so. Um, and, you know, I've never seen, uh, I've never heard the UK banking system being described as promiscuous, but uh, that's something that we need to have at the back of our minds. Um, there's a lot to discuss, a lot of ground to cover, and one of the reasons we invited Sir Howard was because he was the um, inaugural chairman of the Financial Services Authority, um, you know, taking the regulation of financial services as a whole um, out of the central bank. Um, and I, I, I may be wrong or misspeaking when I say uh, the purveyor of open banking uh, in its early days. Um, so we need to have that at the back of our minds uh, in this discussion. Um, you know, Sir Howard brought us to where we are today. And today is the, the period where, you know, um, Apple just launched its um, virtual reality, um, you know, Google, Google. <laughs> you know, it's funny that whenever I see that word, I, I just stop to think how it's pronounced. Um, and um, so much is happening on AI that is uh, thwarting uh, institutionalized, um, you know, businesses. Sure, so, thank you. Um, so first point of correction, I've spent nearly 20 years in retail banking okay. in my career. That's... And I'm older than I look, unfortunately. <laughs> um, it's interesting to see what, uh, what's happening in uh, especially recent trends. I mean, we've lived with AI for a long time. I mean, AI is not a new thing. I mean, even credit lending decisions use an algorithm that take into account people's spending habits. People have Alexa, uh, uh, you know, Siri on their phones and use it on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, we've been comfortable with the notion of AI ever since uh, uh, the first science fiction book was written and the first uh, movie introduced it to us as well. And a lot of consultancies, if there are consultancies in this organization, in this room here, um, the first thing that you will do is probably tell clients the bottom line, remove headcount, and that'll help your profit margins. Um, that's obviously the, 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 the strongest line to sell uh, services, but it's, it's going to hit banking in ways that it's not hit before. You know, um, something I say in my book is that uh, as I was putting the book together, um, I came to a point where I said, uh, if the product doesn't change, nothing changes. And then I spent about a year and a half thinking which of the banking products that is ripe for change. And you'll see this in the book. It was published last year, right? And I said, the deposit business. That's the product that defines the industry. That's the product that you really need to get right if you're going to get your cost of funding in order. And that's exactly the business that is in transition. Okay, now just have that at the back of our minds and somewhere in this conversation, I hope it comes through. But at this point, let's get a comment from um, Barney Frank, uh, because I think that Sir Howard, Howard um, pointed out several things that that is now, you know, uh, up for discussion. Too big to fail, deposit insurance. Where do you think this is today? And uh, where do you think these are today? And, and uh, in, in terms of the structure that you had built, Barney, in the Dodd-Frank Act, um, you know, and, and it's now uh, under stress in the US banking system. Well, let me begin by agreeing with a uh, point that Howard made, that the, uh, the problems in our system are, I think I said, not fundamental. Uh, I believe the American banking system is fundamentally sound, and in particular, the regulatory framework we established in 2010 in the Financial Reform Bill. I will give you one linguistic explanation. I do not refer to it as the Dodd-Frank Act because, in my experience, anyone who refers to himself in the third person sounds ridiculous, unless he is Charles de Gaulle. Uh, he was able to do that, but no one else can carry it off. Um, what we had were a couple of problems. Well, my view of financial regulation and its historical function 
was actually borne out by what just happened. <clears throat> and it is this. <clears throat> you have a system which is working reasonably well, and then innovation comes, and it has outstripped the rules and regulations. And you then have to, the regulations have to be updated to take into account the new activity, and that stays pretty stable until the next set of innovations. Briefly, in America, we had no national financial institute, no national businesses until the late 19th century, and there was no national regulation. And then came the nationalization of steel and oil and railroads. So for the first part of the 20th century, you had national rules adopted, the Federal Trade Commission, the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Federal Reserve System. That worked well, but it had one new issue, which was the need for finance capitalism, and you had a totally unregulated stock market. So in the New Deal, you got under Franklin Roosevelt regulations of the stock market. That worked very well, and it was very stable until the 70s when inter information technology revolutionized things by making possible securitization, et cetera. Plus, you had funds coming into America from oil-producing countries, Asian countries with large balance of payments. And so, again, you had a whole new set of activity that went unregulated for too long. And what we did in the financial reform bill in 2010 was to adopt rules for the new activity enabled by revolutionized information technology and a flood of capital. That worked well and continues to work well. But then very recently and within a shorter period of time, because technology now moves more quickly, a couple of other innovations destabilized the system. One was cryptocurrency. And one of the things that is clearest is, if there had been no cryptocurrency, there would have been no crisis in America. And if again, I would just make one correction when people say, well, it began with Silicon Valley. No, it began with FTX. And it began with the scare of FTX. And one of the things I'm going to talk about, and I have differed with Emmanuel on the extent to which I think there's going to be a personalization of finance, I think, yes, that has a lot of advantages for a lot of people, but there are a lot of people who don't want to have to deal with their own finances and aren't capable of it if they were given that chance. And in fact, one of the problems, the single biggest problem that affected our banking system recently in America was frankly the irrationality of a substantial part of the public. They became frightened of crypto, they misunderstood relationships where an institution was at risk of crypto volatility and was not. And then in panic, and this was the single biggest cause, moved their deposits. And that was the other technological change. Technology came to the financial institutions in the 80s and 90s and allowed them to do all kinds of things, credit default swaps and securitization that caused problems. What we are seeing today is the uh, migration of technological innovation to deposits. We have a metaphor that we've always used called a run on the banks. That was literal. People ran down to the bank to take out their deposits. That doesn't exist anymore. What we now have is a push button on the banks. You have a situation where with two pushes of your finger, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can move deposits. And that was the major, that was certainly the only cause for signature. It exacerbated uh, Silicon Valley. It was a major cause for First Republic. What you had was an irrational overreaction to the volatility of crypto that triggered this technologically supercharged deposit shifting. So, Going forward, and there's one other issue that uh, we, we had underestimated. It's not a new issue, and that is the conflict 
between macroeconomic and macroprudential regulation. And I have to say, it's nice to be in a room where I can say that and not have to have it translated uh, to, to the average individual. But that arose once before. People will remember that in the early 2000s, one argument was that the way to deal with the housing speculation would be to shut down the economy. That is, one argument was use macroeconomic tightening, higher interest rates, to deal with the macroprudential problem of irresponsible lending. Fortunately, that was rejected because it just would have had terrible economic consequences. And I think we were too confident after that, I'll confess I was, that you could separate the two, that you could do macroeconomic regulation thinking about the economy and then also do specific macro prudential efforts. But what happened here was the, the macroeconomic decision to spike interest rates very high, very quickly, generated macro prudential problems. That was particularly the case with Silicon Valley, unlike Signature and First Republic, but Silicon Valley had this problem of a devaluation of its assets because of the rapid increase in interest rates. And you have to make some distinctions. Because of that, because of the conflict between macroeconomic and macro prudential and the effect of higher interest rates in devaluating Silicon Valley, they actually had more of a solvency problem. We at Signature had purely a liquidity problem. And in fact, that's one of my arguments that says what we did in the financial reform bill in 2010 has largely succeeded because, yes, we had some failures, but the failures were predominantly illiquidity. The banks, including Silicon Valley, but certainly for First Republic and I, absolutely for Signature, we were solvent. Our assets were fine. The problem was this supercharged panic that was allowed to withdraw deposits instantly. So going forward, I think there were two things we have to do. First of all, and I noticed an article in today's Bangkok Post in which the Europeans boast correctly that they are further along in regulating crypto than America. I think getting regulation of crypto so that you can diminish the fear of volatility is very important. It is clear that was the trigger for the deposit withdrawals. It is only banks that had some crypto relationship. And by the way, in the case of Signature Bank, we were at zero risk for crypto volatility. What we had with crypto was if there were two entities that were customers of the bank that had deposited hard dollars in the bank and they wanted to deal with each other in crypto, we were the platform. We had no crypto deposits, we made or took no crypto loans. But the fact that we had that relationship with companies that wanted to deal in crypto triggered this extraordinary withdrawal of deposits. And then the argument is, well, why hadn't you prepared for that? I will say this, people have talked about stress tests. If you had done a stress test a month before in which you predicted the level of panic over crypto and the consequent withdrawal of deposits, it would have been considered wildly unrealistic. I do not think there was any way by liquidity to have dealt with this outburst of uh, of kind of the reverse of the tulip mania. And that's what hit us. So going forward, one, there should be regulation of crypto. And we do have the problem, they know this today. Uh, there is one fundamental irrationality in the American financial regulatory system that is politically unsolvable. And that is the distinction between the Securities and Exchange Commission, which does securities, and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, which does commodities. And we were politically, the problem is that the Commodity Futures Trading Commission is seen by the agricultural industry as its friend. And they see the Securities and Exchange Commission 
as the instrument of those slick Easterners who run the stock markets 24-7. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with that classic American movie, It's a Wonderful Life, but uh, we needed Jimmy Stewart, uh, and he wasn't available. Instead, everybody was sitting at home moving their deposits. Given those two changes, again, if there was not panic about crypto and there was deposit insurance above 250 for transaction accounts, there would have been no crisis for First Republic or Signature. Silicon Valley did have a problem. They made some mistakes and they had the devaluation uh, of the treasuries. We did not, Signature had that same amount. So for that reason, I believe that uh, our system is fundamentally sound. By the way, given the destabilization of the rapid spike in interest rates and the turbocharged deposit shifting and the panic about crypto, I believe the system held up very well. The, uh, you cannot compare the disaster of 2010 with what happened with three banks this time. So I, I believe that with, and there's one last optimistic point. The fixes we need going forward are more technical than ideological. I think there is a very real chance that you can get rarely in America today cross-party cooperation to deal with crypto. In fact, little known fact that people should now know, the chairman and the senior minority member of the Financial Services Committee, the Republican Patrick McHenry and the Democrat Maxine Waters, get along very well. They had in fact reached an informal agreement on regulating crypto in the last Congress. Secondly, while there was some conservative ideological opposition to increasing deposit insurance, in the meantime, there were some workarounds that you can do, and I believe the case for that, for increasing deposit insurance for transaction accounts, is very strong. With those two fixes, uh, the American system is uh, back out of trouble. But the last point I would make is this, and I was proud to be asked by Emmanuel to do the floor of his book, and there was no question. I mean, it's, he's been an important uh, early warning system that this was coming, and it will come. I do not think, however, it is transformative of the entire industry. I think you're more likely to segmentation in which a substantial part of the industry will be available for people to do decentralized peer-to-peer -peer financing but there will continue to be a large number of people who will need the more active intermediation of the banks. And so I believe you're gonna see those two together. And part of the problem is, if you look at the way the public behaved in our last crisis, it is not encouraging. Um, I have felt in the political world that there is too much emphasis on blaming politicians and not on recognizing that much of the behavior that politicians engage in that is not what it should be is driven by the voters. Politicians who are doing irresponsible things are very often reacting to the irresponsible desires of the voters. I was confronted once by someone who wanted me to explain how I could justify how politicians behave and I said I don't. Uh, I agree that politicians make a lot of mistakes. The media often exacerbates that. But the voters are no bargain either. Well, it turns out neither are the depositors. And so when we talk about empowering the individuals, uh, remember that there are going to be some individuals who shouldn't be given that power. And the last point I would make is that that was a problem with Signature. One of the steps Signature made, Emmanuel, had mentioned to me early on that we were in advance here, was to enable our depositors who wanted to move in a decentralized direction, who wanted to deal with each other with crypto, we got penalized for that. Even though we were at no risk whatsoever, but because we were publicly identified correctly as a leading collaborator with people who dealt in crypto, that contributed to the deposit run that was our downfall. I, I'm going to leave all those comments up in the air. So, Howard, 
you were a pioneering regulator, but um, you know you've seen um, some of the early iterations of crises of this nature, liquidity, um, you know, funding problems, and so on. Um, now, apply the mind that you had uh, as a regulator in your time to what's happening today in the U.S. Um, you know, how would a U.K. system have dealt with it? Uh, what were the mechanisms available to you uh, to have contained, um, you know, a liquidity or a, or a funding crisis, um, you know, in, in, in your system? It, it, on the, um, the two important points that, uh, that Barney Frank made um, on liquidity regulation and on the uh, deposit protection, fundamentally, the UK system is broadly the same. Um, I mean, actually, UK deposit protection is somewhat lower than in the US. It's about £80,000 as opposed to $250,000. But then if you think about the relative size of the economy, etc., it's not that far off. And liquidity regulation is largely driven by Basel rules. The liquidity coverage ratios um, are calculated, you know, are set out by Basel. I mean, they're interpreted slightly differently from country to country, but not fundamentally. So I think in, in those two respects, the UK system would not have been any fundamentally different from the uh, US system. I think there are two areas, however, which are somewhat different. And I did mention briefly that in my, uh, in my remarks earlier. And, and that is the treatment of interest rate risk in the banking book, um, which is handled differently in the UK and Europe from um, it is in the US. The US have not taken that into the Basel Pillar 1, Pillar 2 framework whereas um, uh, the, our regulators have. And I think that is relevant to Silicon Valley. I'm not sure it's relevant particularly to Signature or First Republic, but it is relevant to SVB, where they had a, a, a significant unhedged position um, on US treasuries. That would, I believe, not have been possible uh, for, a, for a UK bank uh, to do that. Um, the other thing, of course, though, is the different structure of the banking system that we do not have regional banks in anything like the same way. Different and we regulators. don't certainly have um, the degree of concentration risk which Silicon Valley had. Um, you know, I, we would not have a bank with that degree of concentration risk on one industry sector, on the high tech sector. So that, that just wouldn't feature in, in the UK, and I think it would not be allowed by our regulators, actually. So there are certain aspects of the UK system which would be different from the US, but some that are the same. Can I, I very much agree with all of that, and it is important to distinguish Signature and First Republic from Silicon Valley. They have kind of colonized us to a great extent. Uh, our big sports arena is the TD Bank, Toronto Dominion, but um, that also is an argument against some of my colleagues on the left in America, and it has to do with regional banks and the vulnerability that Howard mentioned of regional banks over-concentrating. If you have only what Canada has, I believe, is several very large, very well-run banks. Four. Yeah, um, that's a degree of concentration that would make some of my friends on the left in America uh, no. panic. But here's the deal. That means that there are no regional banks to over-concentrate. When you have four yeah. national banks, you have a built-in diversification. And uh, so the argument that we need to have more regional banks, it does open us to that danger. That's how I mentioned. Now, concentration uh, risk of the nature that you both of you are talking about with your retail banking head, um, what is AI making possible uh, in terms of the, the, the customer profile of, of banks, uh, you know, going forward especially? Sure. So I actually, um, if I may ask a, a quick question of, uh, of Sir Howard and, and Barney here in terms of digital, and, and to your point in terms of digital banking, 
I just want to clarify with, with a digital banking license like this, such like um, N26 and Revolut and um, who have created uh, banking entities, um, digital banking entities, neo banks. If they're not, not. So in the case of Revolut, for example, Revolut is a bank in Lithuania. So I presume it's protected in some way by the Lithuanian Deposit Protection Scheme. It is not a bank in the UK. It has applied for a banking license and has not so far been given one. Um, and Wonderful. we may speculate about why that is, but the regulators have so far not authorized it as a bank. Um, I think they have concerns about governance and finance. I mean, a whole variety of things. But anyway, they have not. And Revolut have been public. I'm not making, you know, they've been public about the fact that they've been asking for a banking license for some years and have not been granted one. And therefore, there is an issue on deposit protection. And we don't, frankly, have that industry structure. Yeah, by the way, one other issue that is now emerging in America, I don't know whether it's true uh, elsewhere, and that's the uh, commercial real estate. If you're looking for a problem going forward, and here I have a problem with the regulators. The uh, federal regulators in America, particularly the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, has actually been an obstruction to banks helping with one of our most important social problems, which is the increase in the housing supply. This conversation has many legs that it's standing on at the moment, and we can go down any one of them. There's so much to discuss. So um, Barney's point of commercial real estate and uh, future potential crisis, that's another conversation that's going to take place after this opening keynote. Um, and then um, what's possible with AI, with TO, um, uh, will be a separate conversation on the technology front, uh, drilling down, um, you know, in, in terms of how the institution itself will look like. And some of the issues uh, that I'm very excited about are things like what's happening in decentralized finance. It's 24-7, it's, you know, um, continuous liquidity, the disciplines uh, are not found in traditional banking, uh, and how will we see that convergence uh, eventually taking place, and what can uh, traditional banks learn from decentralized finance? So in the next two days, uh, we're going to drill down uh, many of the issues uh, um, you know, on all these fronts. Um, at this point, uh, I want to thank um, our panelists, and I'll ask my um, uh, erstwhile uh, you know, co-host uh, to conclude the session for us. The recent issues have all been around deposits and liquidity. And uh, the regulators, or former regulators here, uh, seem pretty confident, I think rightly so, that the regulations are adequate to deal with that. And in fact, the regulator has found a solution of actually saving the troubled bank. You may argue not in the most imaginative way, but certainly they solve that. So traditional banking seems to have emerged stronger from the various crises. As I say, as Emmanuel Daniel said, uh, this is covering a very wide perspective, almost the entire banking system. So rather than um, being in the way of your coffee break uh, and uh, some morning snacks, um, I would like to thank everybody on the panel. Uh, because we have exceptional competence here and uh, we are covering the most important issues at helicopter level. And in the next few days, we're going to drill down and uh, our panelists will be here. We'll drill down into more specific levels and it should be a very exciting conference. So um, I think, uh, thank you very much. I, I thank our panel very much.